All right, so because I am at Gateway and because I'm honoring Pastor Robert this weekend, I want you to turn in your Bible to two passages, all right? Matthew chapter 16 and Acts chapter 12. And I'm going to continue this sermon series that Pastor Robert has started, and I'm going to talk to you this weekend about open gates. The word is open gates. Now, this, this story, that I'm, this message that I'm going to share this weekend is very tender and very personal, and I'm going to tell you why in just a few minutes, okay? But I'm talking uh, this weekend to two groups of people. The first group of people, uh, the first group that I'm speaking to this weekend is the group that right now you're, you're really in a sweet spot with God. I mean, you're really hearing God's voice. God is speaking to you. You're hearing him. It seems like when you open the scriptures that it comes alive to you. When you're in worship like we were just a part of, it seems like that heaven has opened over you and your home. Things are good for you. And that's a good season to be in. And I believe the Bible says that we should be in those seasons a lot in our lives, that it should feel that way. It should feel like that the sun is on our face and the wind is at our back. And there are times like that when we all feel that way, and that's a good season to be in. There's another group that I want to talk to this weekend. It's a group that you, you feel like that you're trapped and abandoned. Maybe when I was describing the first group, you, your mind went back to a time when you felt like you were in the first group, but not anymore. It seems like that a storm cloud suddenly gathered, like, you know, like in Texas, storms can come up pretty quickly. And it seemed like that you were in a sunny, good place. Everything was clear and bright. And suddenly, storms kind of gathered over your life. And now you find yourself feeling like you've been trapped or abandoned. It seems like everything is dark. Now, what I love about the Bible is that the Bible, when, when the Bible talks about our spiritual heroes, and the Bible is full of heroes, like men and women that are our heroes, what the Bible does not do, the Bible shows these heroes in good times and bad times. We see David defeating Goliath, and then we see David repenting for murder and adultery. I mean, we see the good part and the bad part of just about every Bible character in the Bible, right? And Peter is no exception. Peter's by, my, by far, besides Jesus, Peter's my favorite New Testament character. But the Bible, when, when, when the Bible talks about the life of Peter... The Bible does not hide the good and the bad of Peter. The Bible shows us both sides. I want you to turn right now to Matthew chapter 16, and we're about to see one of the highlights of Peter's lives. Peter, as you know, was the first one out of the boat. Peter was the first one to really, really understand who Jesus was. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16 and look at verse 15. And Jesus has just had a really difficult conversation with some of his followers. In fact, some of his followers, when Jesus really began to demand that they serve and sacrifice in order to follow him, a lot of them turned and walked away from Jesus. But Peter stood there in front of all the other disciples and listen to what Jesus asked him in verse 15. He says, Jesus looked at his disciples and says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, I mean boldly, with great authority, Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Would you all say that out loud with me? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, Peter, the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And just a moment ago, we prayed for eyes to see and ears to hear. And Jesus says, Peter, you have now eyes to see. You have spiritual ears to to hear. You have a spiritual mind to understand, and because of that, I've revealed myself to you. I've shown something to you that you couldn't have gotten there by yourself, but you allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and because of that, I have shown you who I am. Verse 18, and I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now notice, listen very carefully. Most of you know this scripture, but listen to exactly what Jesus says to Peter. He says, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
Now notice the two things that Jesus, so Jesus is being very prophetic here. Jesus is looking at Peter, and and Peter's at the big moment. Peter's never been finer than right now. Peter's never been more like God than right now. He is alive with Jesus. And Jesus leans in and says, Peter, I'm going to build my church on people like you. It's on people like you that I'm going to build my church. Now, Peter, listen very closely to me. The gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Peter, it's on people like you that I'm going to build my kingdom. And whatever you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. So he's talking about things that bind him. And he's talking about gates. And up up until this point in the scripture, it's funny to me that gates have not really been a problem up until this point in the scripture. I mean, have you ever seen the Bible talk about an evil gate? Why Why did Jesus specifically say, the gates of Hades will not prevail against you. Gates. What does gates have to do with anything? Why did Jesus use that language to Peter? Peter is fully alive right now, and and yet it seems like Jesus is being a bit of a downer here. The gates of hell, things that bind you. Fast forward to Acts chapter 12, and now a lot has happened between Matthew chapter 16 and Acts chapter 12. Peter was, uh, you know, when Jesus said, he looked at his disciples after Matthew 16 and says, listen guys, I'm about to go die on the cross and all of you are going to abandon me. You're all gonna run for your life. Who was the guy? Peter said, now listen, all these other guys may run off and abandon you, but I'm not, I'm not. I'm gonna stand right here by you and whatever they do to you, they'll do to me. Well, sure enough, as soon as they came to arrest Jesus, it was Peter that pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of Malchus and Jesus had to go put the ear back on the young guy. And then once Jesus was arrested, guess who took off running? All of them, including Peter. And it was Peter that stood on the outside of the gates while Jesus was being judged, while Jesus was being sentenced to death. It was Peter that stood on the outskirts and three different times people said, hey, aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you one of his disciples? Aren't you the one who followed the Galilean? And three different times it was Peter who said, no, I don't know the guy. Never met the guy. I don't know who that guy is. Have no idea. And then the rooster crowed, and the words of Jesus came back to Peter, and Peter sat there and sobbed and wept because he had made a promise to Jesus that he had broken. Well, Jesus, when Jesus comes back after the resurrection, it was Peter that he found, and it was Peter that he sought out. And he looked at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? If you love me, go feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Tend my sheep. It was Peter, that Jesus looked in the eye and said, Peter, listen, I forgive you for abandoning me. I forgive you for running away from me. Now, Peter, go and do what I've called you to do. Take care of my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. It was Peter that was in the upper room with that group of people. And and after a time of fasting and praying, the Holy Spirit came upon this group of people. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of them spoke in languages that they'd never spoken in. And and Tongues of fire begin to settle down upon them and it was Peter that stepped out on the ledge for the very first big sermon of the local church and he stood out on that ledge and he says, listen, it's not, we're not drunk like some of you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning, but this is what's happened. This is what was prophesied in the prophet Joel that in the last days I'm gonna pour out my spirit upon men and women alike and they're gonna prophesy and proclaim the kingdom. And that day thousands of people came to Christ because it was Peter who stood there boldly proclaiming Jesus. Those were the good days for Peter, right? In Acts chapter 12, those, everything has gone horribly wrong. The local church is devastated. In Acts chapter 12, James, the brother of John, not James, the brother of Jesus, but James, the brother of John, has been murdered, executed, but he was one of the leaders of the local church in Jerusalem, and he's been executed. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Peter and John had seen a crippled man healed outside the the temple. They had seen power and demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. They had seen thousands of people come to Christ. And now suddenly, the leaders of the local church were being picked off one by one. Herod, the evil Herod, was executing them as fast as he could arrest them. And I want you to imagine yourself at Gateway Church that you're now huddled up inside of a dark home somewhere in Jerusalem and everything you thought would happen, everything that you thought, all the great things that Jesus had promised, everything seemed dark 
everything seemed desolate at this point. Leaders were being killed. People were being persecuted. And now Peter, the great apostle Peter, is in jail. And Herod is simply waiting till the end of Passover to kill him publicly too. The Peter was the bedrock. Peter was the, the, the main leader of the local church. He was the apostle, the rock. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. and The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. On this rock, Peter, I'm going to build the church. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. All those words are ringing now into the ears of the believers. They're wondering if what Jesus said was really true or not, because Peter has been arrested. Peter has been sentenced to death. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison. This is what I love, but the church, his friends, his brothers and sisters, the people that loved him, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I want to stop here just for a moment. I want to tell you something about Gateway. Gateway is a praying church. I know that. It was birthed in prayer. Pastor Robert is not just a pastor who prays. Pastor Robert's a praying pastor. And I want you to understand something. There is something powerful about being a part of a praying church instead of just a church that prays. I'm a part of a praying church at New Life. All churches pray, but very few churches are praying churches. And there's something powerful that God does in the midst of a praying church. And the early church, the first church that was birthed by the Holy Spirit was a praying church. In verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. I want you to think back now. I want, the, I want you to let the words of Matthew chapter 16 ring in your ears as I'm telling you this story. He's standing between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Like, whack! I like that about God. Just, just whack, wake up! <laughs> you know what's really interesting about this is how deep asleep Peter was. Now think about this. He's dying the next day, or the next. And yet the peace of God that passes all understanding had come into that prison cell with Peter, and he was sleeping good. I think he was like slobbering on the guy next to him, kind of sleep good. <laughs> Just kind of laid back good. Dreaming about the Sea of Galilee kind of sleep. He says, quick, get up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. Peter, <laughs> Your name is Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. Peter, get up. And these chains fell off his wrist. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so, and wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him, and Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea what the angel was doing, what was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. He thought he was dreaming. In verse 10, and they passed the first and the second guards, and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. Now, let's stop here just for a moment. This is fascinating. If you have been arrested and sentenced to death, which is, so he was probably being held in a Roman garrison outside the city walls. If, by some miracle, an angel has come to your prison cell and the chains that bound you fall off your wrist and you walk out of the prison cell, the last place you want to go is back into the city. What normally would happen if a prisoner found himself suddenly freed from his prison, he would have fled to the Judean hillside. He would have fled into the desert. He would have fled away from the city. But not Peter. The angel leads him to the city gates. 
Now listen to this very carefully. He says, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. And it opened for them by itself. How many of you have ever seen a picture or maybe visited Jerusalem and seen these gates? This is not a gate leading to your grandmother's garden. These are iron gates that are designed to keep armies outside and you inside. And it opened for them by itself and they went through it into the city. Now why do you think he had to go into the city? What's inside the city? The praying church is waiting for him inside the city. You can read the rest of the story on your own in Acts chapter 12. You know why he went into the city? Because that's where God called him. That was his assignment. That was the calling on his life was inside Jerusalem with that praying church. I have come today to remind some of you that you're standing on the other side of the gate from where God has called you. And I've come tonight with a very encouraging message for some of you, that the gates of hell will not prevail against you and the calling that is on your life and on your family. And for way too long, some of you have stood on the other side of the gate, content with staying away from where God has called you to. When God has designed us to walk through the impregnable gates that the enemy has put in front of us. Gates, the enemy by its very design puts gates around us to confine us, to constrain us, to imprison us, to constrict us, to hold us back. But the gates of hell will not prevail against those who have confessed that Christ is the Lord. 